This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is We Still Hear, Pandemic, Policing, Protest, and Possibility by Mark Lamont Hill, edited by Frank Barrett, with a foreword by Kianga Yamada-Taylor. The uprising of 2020 marked a new phase in the unfolding movement for black lives. The brutal killings of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and countless other injustices large and small, were the match that lit the spark of the largest protest movement in U.S. history, a historic uprising against racism and the politics of disposability that the COVID-19 pandemic lays bare. In this urgent and incisive collection of new interviews bookended by two new essays, Mark Lamont Hill critically examines the pre-existing conditions that have led to this moment of crisis and upheaval, guiding us through both the perils and possibilities, and helping us imagine an abolitionist future. As Eddie S. Glaude Jr. said, quote, Mark Lamont Hill doesn't shy away from the difficult questions, and he is willing to tell the hard truth. In this powerful book, his insight and commitment to justice leap from every page. Read it, be informed, and feel fortified in these trying times. Hill models what Henry James called perception at the pitch of passion. We Still Hear, Pandemic Policing, Protest, and Possibility by Mark Lamont Hill. Out now from Haymarket Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. This episode is my interview with political theorist Wendy Brown. Our goal is to figure out why so much of American culture is pervaded by this intense nihilism, this thrill to the raw and transgressive exercise of power and domination, of cruelty, from the president on down. Brown's book is remarkable, and for its complexity, remarkably readable, and it argues that neoliberalism has played a powerful role. Not just neoliberalism as an economic program that crushes labor, privatizes public services, deregulates industry, unleashes capital mobility, and slashes tax on the rich. That too, but it's also neoliberalism as what Michel Foucault called a rationality. That, as Brown puts it, quote, prepared the ground for the mobilization and legitimacy of ferocious anti-democratic forces in the second decade of the 21st century. The rise of anti-democratic politics was advanced through attacks on society understood as experienced and tended in common, and on the legitimacy and practice of democratic political life. Neoliberals like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman, she writes, were extremely suspicious of the pretension that human reason could reorder the world because it enabled the fantasy that society could be intelligently planned and designed. The antidote was markets and traditional morality, both of which were conceived of as organic and spontaneous fonts of liberty, a liberty that is threatened by a state that— once sanctified by the deluded belief in the existence of society, would establish totalitarianism in the name of seeking social justice. Neoliberal ideas and ideals, however, are not the same thing as the actually existing neoliberal world that we have been living in. Instead of the steadying force of traditional morality, we have conservative Christians using the state to wage a culture war, and impose Christian dominance. Instead of a limited state, we have mass incarceration, border militarization, and empire's permanent war. Instead of post-politics, we have violent far-right fanaticism from the White House to the streets of Kenosha. Brown writes, quote, Instead of organically reproducing civilization, securing social bonds, and governing conduct, Traditional values become battle cries against godless elites, egalitarians, secularists, and Muslims, as badges worn by political, 
religious, and corporate leaders routinely caught in behaviors violating them. Traditional values are reduced to a corporate and political brand, at which point their nihilistic ablation is nearly complete. This, in other words, is why the religious right has become a sort of nationalist movement, for whom values are more about their formal signification of in versus out group status, rather than about any sort of substantive moral content. This is how owning the libs and enjoying the transgression of cruelty, masquerading as political incorrectness, becomes at least as important as stopping abortion. Brown does, in our interview, warn against the intellectual temptation to rely on one big idea like neoliberalism to explain everything. And indeed, I've been thinking when it comes to the rise of American nihilism, empire has also played an enormous role in exposing grand moral visions as mere pretexts for raw power, so degrading the notion that morality matters at all. The Iraq war being launched on a patently fraudulent basis, a permanent war on terror two decades removed from its primal wound, torture being brazenly legitimated by the Bush administration, all of that, I think, did a lot to detach the raw exercise of power from any pretense to principle. Maybe I'll talk about that with Brown in a future interview, but this interview is focused on neoliberalism, which does indeed explain quite a lot. I was preparing for this interview when I first read about the recently issued conservative Great Barrington Declaration, a call for reopening everything and ending all counter-pandemic measures for the young while cloistering elderly people so that the young could get infected with COVID and achieve herd immunity. Neoliberalism's redefinition of freedom and coercion, combined with this hard turn towards nihilism that Brown writes about, I think that in part explains why this proposal on some level quite insane for mass infection of the youth while isolating the old seems to so many people more free and reasonable than the obviously preferable alternative of a competent government response to the pandemic. But such a competent government response in this day and age to so many seems inconceivable. The damage done by neoliberalism, I think, also does quite a bit to explain liberal and democratic troubles countering Trump. Brown writes, quote, Outrage, moralizing, satire, and vain hopes that internal factions or scandals on the right will yield self-destruction are far more prevalent than serious strategies for challenging these forces with compelling alternatives. I think that's in part because liberals in the Democratic establishment have been looking for an exit from nihilism, and that Biden, because he represents a sort of normalcy, appears to offer just that. But I think there's also a form of liberal nihilism at play here, in the rationale that many offered for not voting for Bernie even though they supported Bernie's policies, that Bernie's proposals or his candidacy were just impossible, that democracy, its promise of self-government, and achieving through such self-government a caring society and a humane future on this planet, that those might be noble ideas, but that's just not how it works, and there's nothing we can do to change it. It's the task of the left, then, I think we learned this year pretty powerfully, to fight for the social and for democracy, to build power while expanding people's horizons to insist that our fates are linked and that we can together imagine and fight for a livable future. I want to note two interviews that are related to this interview that I will link to in the show notes. First, my interview with Quinn Slobodian from a while back. We explored how neoliberals designed institutions like the WTO to protect markets from democratic demands for equality, including from the decolonizing world. Then there was my interview with Melinda Cooper, where we discussed how neoliberalism and social conservatism have converged upon holding up the family as the ideal form of social organization, and then pushing responsibility for all of neoliberalism's economic costs, from debt to welfare reform, onto the family. Again, I'll link to both episodes in the show notes in case you miss them or want to listen again. Either way, consider this episode the Foucauldian Threequill to an ongoing series on neoliberalism. Before we get started, this podcast exists only because listeners like you support us at patreon.com slash the dig. 
This podcast's purpose, as you know, is a political one, to help you understand the world in your quest to change it. And so every episode is freely available to everyone, no paywalls. We can only do that, however, because those of you who can afford to support us do so with a contribution. So if you haven't made a contribution yet and you can afford to, please take a quick moment and go to patreon.com slash the dig and make a donation. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Also, I would like to encourage you to join a dig book club to discuss the books discussed here on The Dig with fellow listeners, and then to meet with the authors of those books on Zoom. If you are interested, visit thedigradio.com slash dig hyphen book hyphen club. The next Dig Book Club book is Wendy Brown's In the Ruins of Neoliberalism. So read the book and then meet Wendy Brown. That's thedigradio.com slash dig hyphen book hyphen club. Okay, here is Wendy Brown, who teaches political theory in the political science department and critical theory program at UC Berkeley, where she is also the co-chair of the union-ish Berkeley Faculty Association. Her most recent books are In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, The Rise of Anti-Democratic Politics in the West, and Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution. Wendy Brown, welcome to The Dig. Thanks for having me. You write that debates over the causes of Trumpism have been confused in part because they often pit economic and social explanations against one another, something that has been a really long-standing frustration of mine. You write, quote, Understanding the roots and energies of the current situation requires appreciating neoliberal political culture and subject production, not only the economic conditions and enduring racisms that spawned it. To, To set some context for the rest of the interview, what sort of political culture and human subjects has neoliberalism made, and how does that, in turn, fit in with an economic analysis of the rise of Trumpism. So let's let's start with the familiar understanding of neoliberalism as a set of policies and then I'll, I'll I'll walk it back toward the question you ask about political culture. So our our standard understanding goes something like this. Uh, neoliberalism slashes the social state, privatizes public goods, turns progressive taxation into regressive taxation, smashes unions and above all deregulates capital, just lets it fly, lets it fly locally, but also around the world. So, you know, that's true. But what I think is really important is for us to understand the extent to which neoliberalism is much more than simply a set of policies, but also something that governs us, society, culture, ways of understanding us, and ways of configuring social relations as much as it transforms capital. And what I mean is this, neoliberalism transforms uh, what we might call a, a social state or a Keynesian economic order, not just at the level of economic policy, but at a much deeper level pertaining to how we are to understand freedom the state, our relations with one another, society, and morality. So neoliberalism, the way many of us talk about it, is a form of governing reason, not just a form of economic policy. Now, why does this matter? Because one of the important things that neoliberalism does is is deliver a full frontal attack on the very notion of the public good and society. Margaret Thatcher said it best. There is no such thing as society. There is only individual men and women. And then she paused and their families. So what is she telling us? There's no common. There's no social. There's no society. There's only individuals and or families. We can return to that if we want. What this does is paraphrase something that Hayek spends 
pages, books on, which is attacking the very notion of society, and with it, attacking the idea of a state that is oriented toward producing the good for society. And that means a state that might redistribute the wealth through progressive taxation or through forms of social goods, but also a state that might enact social justice through anti-discrimination and other forms of equality measures, a state that might rectify wrongs like systemic racism or systematic uh, and institutional forms that make women everywhere subordinated, less well-paid, less independent, and fundamentally less equal. So what neoliberalism does is not just attack the idea of Keynesian economic order, but the very idea of the social state at the level of the social. Why is that important? Because what it rolls out in its stead is the idea of a freedom, economic freedom for individuals, but also it rolls out the idea of a moral order that emanates from what Hayek and Friedman and the order liberals and others call traditional morality. Instead of the state intervening in the hierarchies, the exclusions, the racisms, the sexisms, the the, uh, heteronormativity that has so long secured our order, neoliberalism essentially makes way for a political culture that says, no, freedom and the good rest in traditional moral orders. What do we get at the moment that we are starting to get emerging authoritarian leaders like Trump, but not only Trump, around the world? We're getting a population that for four decades has been steeped in the idea that the state should not be intervening in economic freedom or traditional morality. We're getting a deep suspicion of democracy as something that overreaches, that builds a state, that that legislates too much, that tries to push the common, tries to push social justice. We're getting a population that has been fashioned by a form of reason in which not just statism, but social justice or what Trump calls political correctness and um, a lot else is simply wrong and an attack on one's freedom. Then combine that with the economic disaster that neoliberalism produced. Rampant and extreme inequalities, dislocations, deindustrialization in the North as Capital fled to the south and to the east of the world, um, looking for cheap labor and cheap resources. And what you get is a a population that on the one hand is weaned on this form of neoliberal reason, and on the other hand is full of rancor and resentment about its falling status, its collapsing economic future, and feeling more and more that something else in the world is getting what it was supposed to have. Trump comes along and says, it's immigrants, it's essentially black welfare queens, it's all these people who are jumping the queue, you're the anointed ones, you ought to be having um, pride of place. And on top of that, you have all of this demonization of the global elites, the politically correct, multiculturalism, and so forth. All of that, I'm suggesting, is born and bred out of a neoliberal economic and cultural political order. To put it somewhat simplistically, what you're arguing is that we can't fully understand neoliberalism without both Marxist and Foucauldian analyses. What do both offer and what's missing if we just rely on one and not the other? If we stick with the Marxists, we stick with the idea that neoliberalism is capitalism on steroids. It may be a particular form of capitalism on steroids uh, because financialization is born out of neoliberalism. So you get rent seeking and other forms of so-called unproductive wealth production. But it's still basically about the exploitation of labor and the extraction of wealth from the poor concentrated in the rich. That's neoliberalism. It's extreme. It's extreme inequalities. It's extreme 
forms of precarity for uh, those who are not at the top. That's important. It's absolutely right. But it doesn't tell us anything about the larger order of reason that has produced a particular orientation toward that development on the part of the populations governed by it. So it doesn't tell us anything about the anti-democratic thrust of neoliberalism, the ways in which it frontally assaulted democratic institutions, and the very idea of democratic decisions about how things ought to be ordered, how goods ought to be distributed, how the social and economic world ought to be approached. It doesn't tell us anything, if we stick with the Marxist approach, about what kind of subject formation, what what kind of making of the human being neoliberalism generates, how, how it literally converts workers into human capital, not just by generating a gig economy, but also by disseminating the idea that your task is to enhance your own value, keep it from depreciating, uh, and do this at every level, from your social media profile, uh, to your resume, to the particular things you volunteer for, to your particular networks. The entrepreneurialization of the self. The entrepreneurialization, um, I would say, is a earlier phase. And then we get the financialization of the self, where instead of just entrepreneurializing your assets, you then start to get the move to seek to present and brand yourself such that you attract investors in that self and calculate your own self-investments. So it's an interesting shift. This is where I'd have to leave Foucault behind, but keep the framework that he offers, where we're thinking, what are the relations of power through which the self or the subject is being made? He teaches us that neoliberalism gives us an order in which we're entrepreneurialized. That was the Thatcher-Reagan idea. Thatcher explicitly talked about it. But now we're in a financialized model. And, you know, most of my students know that. If you you spend two minutes on the question of the financialized self, they get it. It's not about literally having a financial portfolio. It's about treating yourself as if you were one. Your book analyzes the relationship between neoliberalism's founding thinkers, people like Hayek and Friedman, their ideas, really, the relationship between between their ideas on the one hand and the actually existing neoliberalism that we live under on the other. Why do these ideas of these thinkers matter if, as you write, quote, popular enthusiasm for autocratic, nationalist, and in some cases neo-fascist regimes fueled by myth-mongering and demagoguery departs as radically from neoliberal ideals as repressive state communist regimes departed from those of Marx and other socialist intellectuals, even if, in each case, the deformed plant grew from soil fertilized by these ideas. Why do these thinkers matter then? Is it because, even though this was not their desired world, it is indeed the world that their ideas put into practice made necessary? First, Dan, I have to say you are such a great reader in both senses of reader. There's a a, a way in which you pick out the right moments in somebody's text struggling to land on a point. Uh, But also, if we ever make this book into an audio book, I want you to read it. (laughs) Um, In some ways, I want to suggest that the answer is contained in the statement. We would not say Marx doesn't matter because, after all, state communism veered so dramatically from the vision that he etches of communism as a form of emancipation, equality, and the withering away of the state, where we reduce labor time to a minimum and we are finally free to express our human energies, as he put it, in, a, in an utterly creative way. So, you know, that's Marx's vision. No state communist regime looked anything like that. But we don't say, oh, well, doesn't matter, then Marx doesn't matter because, because these things veered. No, the ideas really do matter because they were inspirational. As I said, Thatcher would thump Hayek's Constitution of Liberty and refer to it as our Bible when she was arguing with some of her advisors about how to proceed to dismantle the social state of the wow. UK. And um, it's not as if I want to, I don't want to argue that 
all that matters is ideas. All the Marxists will jump up and say, oh, that's warmed over Hegelianism. I'm not making that argument, but I do think the ideas matter. Certainly, Friedman mattered in inspiring the first experiment in neoliberalism in Pinochet's Chile. The guys who ruled out the neoliberalization of Chile were, as we know, called the Chicago Boys. They studied under Hayek, um, under sorry, Friedman. And the Ordo liberals, that other lesser known school of liberalism to most Americans, have been extremely influential in Europe and in the development and in the transformation of the European Union. So the intellectuals... To the extent that people call the EU an order liberal state. Exactly. Thank you. So the founding intellectuals matter a lot. They're not all the same. They don't all agree with each other, but they shared a vision of free markets and traditional morality organizing what they understood to be a an emerging, otherwise emerging totalitarian state coming out of social democracy. And they, they shared that vision. So what what I'm arguing is that these ideas really need to be grasped in detail, um, not textual detail, but detail for the vision and the organizing principles, the what what Foucault calls the political rationality of neoliberalism. At the same time, <laughs> um, no, no, you know, here's where we need a little Nietzsche. No, <laughs> no founding idea ends up being realized without a lot of transmogrifications along the way and inversions of those ideas uh, as they encounter other powers, appropriations of them, and all kinds of uh, distortions. So did the neoliberals dream of an anti-democratic authoritarian liberalism, which is how I would describe a contemporary regime like the one we're in with Trump right now? Did they dream of that? Absolutely not. What they hoped for was that, as opposed to a lot of QAnon-believing, myth-mongering, rallied, high-energy, stupid masses, that the masses would be completely politically pacified by reducing them to economic actors and moral actors tending their own lives. They were interested in depoliticizing the masses depoliticizing the state and treating the state, casting the state as that which would tend construction and the stability of markets, the imperative of economic growth, the facilitation of global competitive orders, and the protection of a moral order. That has gone so wildly off the rails is a reminder <laughs> that ideas don't make history. They may be an important part in generating new possibilities. That's why we traffic in them. That's why you and I believe in them. That's why we think it's important for students to explore them and think about them and why we think it's important to circulate new ideas in a political culture dominated by ideas that we think are terrible. But ideas themselves don't fully shape history. They, they intersect other kinds of powers and they generate effects that often are unintended. Degrade democracy and sharply limit the realm of the political, neoliberals had to first deny the existence of and thus destroy the social society. And I want to talk about that first. You, you write, quote, the social is where we are more than private individuals or families, more than economic producers, consumers or investors, and more than mere members of the nation. And that you write, quote, is precisely what neoliberalism set out to destroy conceptually, normatively, and practically. What is the social, and why is it fundamental to democratic culture? And then why do neoliberals like Hayek believe that society does not exist? And for them, the delusion that it does exist, why does that lay the groundwork for totalitarianism? What is the social? We could do a year-long seminar on the, that, and in fact, it has been done. <laughs> um, but let's talk about how the social is getting bandied about in 
between neoliberalism and another order of liberal democracy and what you and I might roughly call socialism or social democracy. When I tried to specify it in the passage that you just read, my aim was to remind readers that if we go to the kind of extreme, I'll call it methodological individualism and cosmological individualism that the neoliberals were hoping for, an individualism that also importantly, and I think we'll get to this, had heteronormative patriarchal families as their own place of being embedded. But if we go to the place of that extreme individualism rooted in families and understand those individuals as simply economic and moral actors in an order where, where they pursue their own good and pursue their own values and their own beliefs and get rid of this domain we call society, get rid of it conceptually, but also get rid of it at the level of political care. What we have done is eliminated two important things. We've eliminated the domain where we actually live together, not just as individuals in households, but live together in a world. But we've also eliminated the space where thinkers like Marx and like other social theorists of equality and inequality, identify the powers that subject some groups, elevate others, exclude or marginalize. We've eliminated from our view the very space and place where racism and sexism and, of course, class operate, but also where all kinds of other forms of social power operate on us. And that's exactly what the neoliberals wanted eliminated. They wanted eliminated this idea that there are that there is a web of connections among us that subordinate some and elevate others, that there's a web of connections and connecting powers among us that both potentially bind us together in common, but also in existing conditions, stratify and alienate and atomize and pit us against one another. So let's call that domain society, and then let's explore why the neoliberals were so hostile to it. They fully believed that it was the social, that the, the belief in the social and the tending of the social that was the material of totalitarianism, that this is where we could be bound together by the state, tended, but also dominated by the state and rearranged by the state in an utterly inappropriate fashion that what we needed to do to get rid of that kind of bloated state was first attack the very idea that there was a domain of the social, a domain of society in which the state belonged, in which it ought to intervene. So that means everything from public housing or, or reform around redlining and other such things, all of those were off the table, to what we call today social or gender justice, uh, I'm sorry, racial or gender justice, um, ways of, of remedying um, subordinations and, and inequalities at the sight of those powers. And of course it meant getting the state out of the redistribution business. So if you were rich or if you were poor, that had to do with your own individual entrepreneurialism or failure at it. And the state certainly didn't belong in the business of provisioning schooling or food stamps or anything else that would remedy or soften those distinctions. One upshot of this disavowal of social power relations is, is that if society doesn't exist, then those who complain of racism or sexism or exploitation, that they're declared to be weak, whining snowflakes. Exactly. Who, who also somewhat perhaps contradictorily also are would-be dictators bent on imposing, you write, quote, a tyrannical political correctness. How does this denial of the social work to facilitate this remarkable inversion whereby oppressed people are demonized as the true oppressors 
of real Americans' liberty? And and how does that in turn fuel this grievance culture that is so, so pervasive on the right from evangelicals and their persecution complex to our extremely whiny and sensitive president? So from from what we've just been talking about, it's fairly easy to extend our understanding of the demonization of state intervention in society and the demonization of social justice to core. I mean, really, the, the first one to cry social justice warriors was Hayek himself. He used the language of social justice warriors. And so, so you know, the antagonists have a nice pedigree here. They're, they're erudite, or somebody was at one point. So the way that this goes is that if the state is in, inappropriately intervening in relations that are actually born by traditional morality, and traditional morality has, according to Hayek and to some degree the ordo liberals, mm, Friedman deals with this less, but it's it's certainly there in both the Thatcher and Reagan rollouts of neoliberalism. If traditional morality is, is the proper ordering of relations because it's tested, evolved over the years. It's, it, it's not that it's true as in it, it's delivered from nature or even God necessarily, according to the neoliberals, but that rather it's our evolved form of living well on earth. And so it must be right. And if the state inappropriately gets in there and starts equalizing gender relations, legitimizing queerness, and upsetting race relations, not only is this despotism interfering with the freedom of evolved orders and the, and the people in them, but it's also a mangling of the proper order of things. So it's statism, it's totalitarianism, it's dictate where there ought to be freedom, and that gets summed up in the idea, too, of political correctness, but it's also implicitly, for those who have this reproach, a kind of exoneration of the weak or the subject or the or the those down on the bottom of the hierarchies the snowflakes who complain about how they're not getting ahead or how they're not getting rich or how they're not succeeding in school because of one vector of power or another that they say that ought to be redressed when in fact... Or how they're getting shot by police or whatever. <laughs> right. Whatever is happening. Yeah, I mean, we could go there. Um, all those terrible things that are happening to them. But actually, this is either their own doing because they're failing to simply be good entrepreneurs of the self or selves who properly invest and attract investors. They're not being the right kind of uh, neoliberal subject, but also they're whining and, and, and depending on the state for it. So we get that combination of rejection of social justice and political correctness on the basis of it being both totalitarian dicta, where there ought to be freedom, and inappropriate because it's really about whining and and complaining and 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 being soft and weak when you ought to be tough and self-made like our president <laughs> imagines he was so what happens such that we get all this grievance at the other end of the spectrum how how do you simultaneously reproach snowflake culture and totalitarian culture and then claim that you're victimized as an evangelical as a as a trump supporter and so forth it seems to me and maybe we'll be talking about this a little bit later here we have to track the way in which the right understands that it was victimized for too long by political correctness culture, but it's also, of course, uh, a grievance against who they imagine controls the elite institutions, including academic institutions. It's a grievance against the so-called global elite and all that was identified with the Davos world. So it's a grievance against all of those who got stuff they shouldn't have gotten or has power to hurt the little guy. And here's where the populism 
the aggrieved populism of Trump supporters melds in an interesting way with the anti-statism and the pro-freedom of neoliberalism. They're not identical. I'm not saying everything is reducible to neoliberalism. I think that's a terrible mistake. I think any time somebody tells you, I have the theory that explains the world, we're already in QAnon territory, (laughs) um, whether it's the left or the right. (laughs) So all I'm trying to do is say what, what, what we have now in this in a world in which there's a lot of right-wing grievance about the power of the left to tell them what to do and to make them feel bad about themselves, that you're seeing an interesting convergence of neoliberal anti-statism and anti-social justice formulations emerging of that with the displacements and the the dislocations, deracinations, and literal dethronements of whiteness and white masculinity uh, that have been part of our last 40 years. And that's a little bit of a different story than just pure neoliberalism. That has to do with some other things as well. I don't mean to accuse you of being a conspiracy theorist, but you did write a pretty damn good book about, you know, putting forward a a theory of the world. <laughs> you know what the problem there is, Dan, that um, it's a, it's an intellectual Achilles heel that I think we almost all share, and it goes something like this. Even if you have the, the knowledge that no one account, no one history, no one theory can explain everything from climate change to the rise of evangelical Christianity to the phenomena of the pandemic to the movements of neoliberal capitalism. Even if you know all of that, there is a tendency on the part of intellectuals. I think it's almost inescapable. You get an idea and you start seeing it evidence for it and manifestation of it everywhere. And there's a little bit of what I'd call an intellectual will to power or or will to conclude. Um, and it's very hard to keep yourself from saying, and this is it. This is what explains everything. And I, I, I see this a lot, for example, in Foucault, who really knew that all we ever had were genealogical accounts of particular things, that all powers did not converge, that the world was not systematic. And you read any of his stories, history of sexu- sexuality or discipline and punish, and it sounds like a total theory. You can't help himself. Let's connect this all to how neoliberals saw politics. You write that political equality is the necessary basis for democracy. And that within a capitalist nation state, creating the conditions for anything approaching political equality requires measures that foster social and economic equality. Quote, more than an ideological persuasion, social justice, modulation of the powers of capitalism, colonialism, race, gender, and others, is all that stands between sustaining the always unfulfilled promise of democracy and wholesale abandonment of that promise. How is it, to connect the discussion we've been having about the social to to the political, how is it that the destruction or degrading of the social lays the groundwork for this attack on the political in general and on democracy in particular that's so core to the neoliberal project? Here I would divide your question into two, and I hope I can remember the second part by the time I get there. (laughs) Um, One is, why is attending to the social so important if we are to have any hopes of any kind of democracy? Forget constitutional or what we call today bourgeois or liberal democracy. If If we're to have any 21st century versions of democracy that are more satisfying and more effective, we still have to attend to that. And I want to say why. Um, But the second has to do with the neoliberals' direct assaults on democracy. So first, we forget this sometimes, that if democracy is about more than voting, if it's really about sharing in rule, if it's really about sharing in governing the powers that otherwise govern us, we have to have the capacity to be political equals. That's not the same as being economically equal, but it is a capacity that requires that voices all matter, 
that ability to participate is something that's afforded to all. And that's why attending to the domain of what we're calling the social is so important. Everybody has to have the capacity (laughs) to be sufficiently housed, fed, and tended to at the level of basic health, mental and physical. Everybody has to have an adequate education to be able to understand what's going on in this world, just minimally. Complex powers, forces, all of those things that are a part of our our contemporary universe, we're not all going to understand every detail, but we need to be able to sift for what seems true and not true. We need to be able to parse information and analyze rhetoric. So we need shelter, food, ability to participate, knowledge and education or information sufficient for that. This is not radical. This Democrats have known For almost every century that democracy has been theorized or practiced in the West or elsewhere, until our own, where democracy is either reduced to market forces or it's reduced to voting or it's reduced to, you know, minimal enfranchisement, all of those things, of course, enfranchisement and voting may matter, but they're insufficient to have democracy. And we have no better testimony to that than what has been the effect on democracy of the tremendous denigration of public education, K through 20, K through 16, let's put it that way, in the past 40 years. Destroy an educated population and you basically have destroyed democracy, especially now, especially when we really need to be able to understand and know things and sift information in order to be able to be part of what shares in the discussions and the the powers that otherwise govern us. So that's why it's important to think about the social in relationship to democracy. You don't just leave home and then go and be a Democrat. Secondly, the neoliberals understood that if they could reduce democracy to voting, to bare liberalism, rights and voting, that they could get rid of what they considered the danger of the, of the social state. They were all very clear about it, that if you enfranchise the masses, if you have universal enfranchisement, you're going to get demands from the masses for a social state. They were very clear about that, and they just thought the masses were wrong. They were just fundamentally wrong. They were confusing fairness and and desert, as they put it, with freedom and the good. And that's kind of an old-fashioned conservative view that universal suffrage is a big problem. <laughs> it is. It's a, But they're very blunt about it. They're all right out there with it. They really understand that the way that you did that, but they didn't try to get rid of it, except for people like Buchanan, where um, McLean has given us this you know, magnificent book explaining on how explaining how Virginia school and of of neoliberalism actually did work on gerrymandering, voter suppression, all of the other things that are part of getting rid of universal suffrage. But what the mainstream guys did was just say, we just need to reduce it. We just need to get rid of democracy understood as popular sovereignty. It's not about the people ruling. It's just about the people voting and having rights. And those who are legislating must not legislate in the economy or in the social order. They must just legislate for it, meaning they have to keep it propped up. They have to keep the train running. They have to keep markets competitive. They have to construct uh, the laws that will help protect traditional morality and markets, but they can't actually get in there and mess with those things. So they understood that if they could restrict democracy on the part of the people to voting and, and, and civil liberties, an understanding of democracy for the people is just about voting and civil liberties. And then if they could restrict legislators from doing more than simply protecting markets and morals, they had reduced democracy without destroying universal suffrage. And what did they reduce it to? They'd really just reduced it to liberalism. 
classic liberalism with a little neo turn because instead of assuming that markets run themselves and that a minimum minimal state or no state is the best state, you need some state. You need some state to keep the whole thing running, and you need some technocrats and or some thoughtful uh, governors in place. But they weren't interested in those people being democratic representatives. And that's where we get to a crucial issue. They were perfectly happy, especially Hayek and the Ordos, with something they overtly called liberal authoritarianism. You could have an authoritarian in power as long as that person respected both markets and morals and the civil liberties of the people. Because for them, it was only totalitarianism that was illiberal. That's the problem. Totalitarianism means for them an an expansive, overreaching state. Authoritarianism simply means an authority. And as long as liberalism is the constraint or the limit, then it's okay. And that's what we got. I mean, we don't have the version they wanted because, you know, they would hate Trump. He's he's like, you know, it's unsteady. It's chaotic. It's messing in markets. It's messing in all kinds of things. He's a demagogue. He's got, you know, mass energies that they wanted deactivated, that he's activating. Um, All of that they would they, they would loathe. Instead of the political being constrained, it's everywhere. Right. But something like the EU, that's okay. Because that's, you know, a technocratic operation that makes sure all the states and uh, nation states in in um, the EU South are held to a strict liberalizing standard. We call it austerity measures uh, and that they are essentially held to it by a technocratic form of governance. I mean, it's literally governance by algorithm. If their budgets, if Greece or Spain submit a budget to the EU that is insufficiently, is not properly balanced and looks insufficiently competitive, it will trip a bunch of uh, algorithmic wires and the budgets rejected and austerity measures get imposed. That, that would be fine with them. Milton Friedman wrote, quote, The fundamental threat to freedom is power to coerce, be it in the hands of a monarch, a dictator, an oligarchy, or a momentary majority. But we we do, in fact, have an oligarchy thanks to neoliberalism. How could Friedman and others deny that power relations exist within markets and that those private imbalances of power then become larger if unchecked by government? And that then such concentrated market power inevitably exercises coercive political power, not only in terms of capitalist labor relations, which they would also deny, but also just directly through the democratic state itself. Does Friedman do this just by by, by tautologically defining coercion as repressive power exercised by the state? From my reading... And from reading others who read the neoliberal classics even more closely than I do, not one of them would have endorsed the plutocratic or oligarchic regimes that we have today. They understood that not only would the masses demand a social state if you let democracy run rampant, but that the other great danger was monopolies and concentrations of economic power unless the state intervened to keep those broken up. And their dream was not to have the state run by capital, but to have the state insulated from the demands of the people on the one hand and capture by capital on the other. Neither one has happened. <laughs> this is, you know, this is where we're looking at the at the deviation of the revolution from the uh, intellectual formations that inspired it. But this is why the work of people like Piketty uh, and others are so important, that what they are revealing from a non-Marxist direction is the extent to which capture of the state by plutocrats, by capital, has not only made the rich richer, but has also, in his view, throttled economies at the level of productivity, that it's made them into rent-seeking economies, that it, it essentially turns them into economies that we have one today that is constantly cutting tax breaks and subsidizing the rich 
setting out tax breaks f- f- and for the rich and subsidizing the rich uh, while squeezing the poor, and that that's an unsustainable market economy. That's not a market economy. That's a state captured by capital. And in particular, the ordo liberals really argued that what you needed to, to insulate against that was a technocratic state. You need a technocracy that is not run by vested interests. I mean, the order liberals se- seem a lot more clear headed in general about what sort of state power is required to get what end accomplished. Yeah. I'm afraid we now need to insert here that they were also a lot closer to the fascists. They're the one group in the neoliberal, in the Mont Pelerin society uh, that did not see fascism as much of the, as as being as much an enemy as they saw socialism. Um, it doesn't mean they were fascists, but they they didn't have any trouble at all with a mass society organized by a very strong state that would tend the people through particular moral political practices and uh, establish a very technocratic state um, that had no responsiveness whatsoever to popular demands. The neoliberal attack on democracy, there's kind of a multi-step mutually reinforcing process here, it it makes this state less democratic, but then it also engenders hostility toward and disaffection with the very notion of democracy, this sort of red pilling of people of, oh, democracy is, is false, and now I understand that this is how things really operate, which paves the way for popular support for authoritarianism. But To me, things seem quite different on the left. The Bernie campaign, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, and Sunrise and the Green New Deal, they all seem fundamentally connected in their assistance on the primacy of the social. Bernie's call to to fight for someone you don't know, Occupy's collective occupation of of public space as as a means to reintroduce class politics into democracy, the massive multiracial character of this year's anti racist protests. Or, or Sunrise's insistence that we can indeed imagine and then build a livable future together. Your, your book doesn't, doesn't cover this. It's more on, on the right and on the neoliberals. But I'm curious, do you think that the attack on democracy, the neoliberal attack on democracy and its, and its being discredited, that it's had kind of a opposite effect on this newly resurgent socialist left, which, which has instead been demanding a deeper form of democracy? than we've ever experienced in this country at the very same time that the right is embracing kind of like total anti-democratic nihilism? The short answer is yes. Starting in this country, I think with Occupy and then what we could call the first wave of Black Lives, there is no question that not only the insistence on democratizing political and social life, but also economic life. I mean, for Occupy, that that identification of the 99% and then the beginning of what became a routine chant at every social movement for the next decade, this is what democracy looks like when gathering in assemblies, when gathering in squares, when protesting, when shouting, when, but also when presenting as Black Lives and Occupy and Extinction Rebellion and others do as a kind of naked demand on the part of the people for a better world and a world in which power was not concentrated, held, used against us, used against the planet and so forth. So I agree with you that there is an emerging radical democratic demand and vision from most of these movements. We might pause, though, and think about the whether the anti-statism of the neoliberals is one of those inadvertent inheritances that is also part of what shapes 
and contour some of the understandings that emerge from these movements. I'm not a big fan of the state. I think, however, for example, the emphasis on mutual aid today that's coming out of the anarchist end of uh, a lot of these social movements, the absolute suspicion of state forms of distribution, the way in which abolitionism has moved across every domain of state power and the suspicion of any possibility of democracy, social justice, socialism, entailing state power, or let's just say the the use of state, of the state. I, I think we just at least have to plumb that and worry about it. And the reason I raise that is that The reality of the Bernie campaign, which I support from beginning to end, is that it was a campaign mobilizing the people for power, for for popular power, for social movements, for popular demands, and for all the right things, education, health care, transformation of the way we understand public goods and public provisioning. All of it in the end lands at the feet of the state. All of it in the end, making all of those things work, would require not only a tremendous amount of state mechanisms for uh, creating programs, for generating um, and distributing goods and so forth. For Medicare for All or for the Green New Deal. All of those. And we know that. And at the same time, all of them also... And here, I almost want to whisper, require capitalism. What I mean is, all of them require that there continues to be a a fund (laughs) or or a mode of financing all of these, which depends upon a mode of growth. I'm not saying they require competition in the deregulated form of the neoliberals. I'm not saying that they require the viciousness and uh, exploitativeness and climate and and planet damaging qualities of existing markets but they all do require it, especially if if one imagines bernie you know being in office in january they're not about a new a radically new political economy they're about a radically transformed or re-regulated and redistributed capitalism, but it can't be that radical without crumpling. So there's some things that have been, I want to say, inherited by the left, by us, and I include myself on it, in, in, in our visions of a, of a more radical democracy, a more socially just world, and obviously a more um, sustainable one. But that has some of the anti-statism of the neoliberals in it, and at the same time has some disavowed uh, affirmations or dependencies in it that we haven't thought through. I think that's really interesting. And it not it also like an age-old question for socialists, which is how do you use social democracy, which is going to raise money from capitalism, skimming it off the <laughs> the top while 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 moving toward or holding on to a horizon of something beyond capitalism it is an age old question it's a really big question now that capitalism is fully globalized and fully financialized it's really changed the game for for understanding how to do this it means that we don't get to imitate what the uh, you know uh, endlessly cited northern european states represent, um, because that was a post-war production of a non, a, a much less globalized capitalism and a pre-financialized capitalism with tremendous resources in those states. We're in a different game now. We're certainly in a different game in terms of where production takes place of most of the goods that most people in this country and and elsewhere in the north depend on and want so and we're in a different game because of the need to cut our relationship to fossil fuels yesterday so it's a old question with a novel set of challenges and predicaments and i i just think we need to own up to it i just think we need to face it and figure out how not to promise magic 
while at the same time responding to the emergency that the climate crisis and the devastation of older forms of democracy, constitutional democracy, liberal democracy, whatever you want to call it, has produced. Those twin crises mean that something has to happen that's pretty dramatic, but at the same time, the possibilities of snipping the threads of financialization are almost zip, and the possibility of being able to radically reconfigure globalized production and distribution, as even Bernie promised to do, uh, to to return jobs to Americans and to, you know, all that stuff we know so well. Th- that's also magic. So, so we need to get real here, even while we need to be radical and utopian and urgent in the reality that we try to build. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be, and you can support them on patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Corona, Climate, Chronic Emergency, War Communism in the 21st Century by Andreas Malm. The economic and social impact of the coronavirus pandemic has been unprecedented. Governments have spoken of being at war and find themselves forced to seek new powers in order to maintain social order and prevent the spread of the virus. This is often exercised with the notion that we will return to normal as soon as we can. What if that is not possible? In Corona Climate Chronic Emergency, Leading environmental thinker Andreas Malm demands that this war footing state should be applied on a permanent basis to the ongoing climate front line. He offers proposals on how the climate movement should use this present emergency to make that case. There can be no excuse for inaction any longer. Corona Climate Chronic Emergency War Communism in the 21st Century by Andreas Malm. Out now from Verso Books. Let's turn to neoliberalism's relationship with social conservatism, both in theory and in practice, which is really core to the argument you make in your book. For Hayek, both markets and morals are, quote, rooted in liberty and generating spontaneous order and evolution. They're radical opposites, any kind of deliberate and state-administered social policy, planning, and justice. They, quote, both spontaneously yield order and development without relying on comprehensive knowledge or reason, and without a master will to develop, maintain, or steer them. Are markets and traditional morality for Hayek and other neoliberals similar but distinct things with a shared enemy, or are they really more basically part of the same organic order that structures humans morally and then relates those humans to one another, I guess, through the the price signal? They're only similar for the neoliberals in one important way, which is that they both have this quality that that Hayek calls spontaneous. And by spontaneous, he doesn't mean um, what we mean when we say we spontaneously decided to you know go out and get a drink. <laughs> we he 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 simply means that they emerge on an out of an energy of their own without being directed by the human mind or even human intention. And they don't come from the font of human knowledge. Rather, they emerge from a system that they build on their own. And he's not, he's not religious here. That has to do with what happens when human beings try and do things and fail at things and so forth over time. That what works out, according to Hayek, is that a, an emergent system arises. And the emergent system of markets, the emergent system of morality, those are tried and tested. They evolve, they adapt, they change, they, they order our actions, but they don't order our actions by telling us what to do. They order our actions through the incentives and constraints and mores and so forth that they harbor. But that's where the parallel probably needs to stop. Because what Hayek wants to say about markets is that that, and and not only Hayek, but the others, is that that order is provided by competition. 
What they want to say about morals is that that order is provided uh, by hierarchy, by order that is structured with everyone having a place. And yet it's not coercive like markets. It's voluntary conformity. It's yes, somehow it's, non-coercive. Exactly. <laughs> it's not coercive because the hierarchy doesn't actually entail a state. It doesn't entail, you know, this is a sleight of hand, but I'm just trying to channel them for you here. Please. (laughs) And, and, you know, look, Amy Coney Barrett is perfect here, right? (laughs) She, she, She was part of a religious order we now know that had a place for everybody, absolutely hierarchical, submissive women, um, who agreed to everything from, you know, being lower down on the hierarchy to providing sex on demand, and yet agreed to it agreed to it because it gratified a need for order, because it gratified a belief, because it gratified whatever it gratified. But she could have walked away any time. She was Voluntary not, submission. Absolutely. But voluntary, you what know. What does that mean? <laughs> probably we need to go back to Plato here. You know, right. finding your place in the order, nothing is better. Nothing is better than doing what you were fitted to do. So... Their understanding of this is not that markets are hierarchical. Markets are inequal, unequal. They have they they have unequal results, and what happens in their mind is that people who are aggrieved about market results confuse results with the freedom that they had in the market itself. That results are a different matter from um, the fact that you're free and, as it were, equal. Uh, in the market. But moral orders are different. They're not structured by equality and and freedom in that way. They're structured by hierarchy and an order that is stable and comforting and generative and secure because they've been tried and tested over time. Now, one more thing I should add here. Um, Hayek, who's the best theorist of this stuff, he goes the furthest on it, does have an awareness that what he refers to as traditional morality, a Christian morality, a patriarchal morality, a private property-centered morality, a family morality, is not the only morality in the world. He's not unworldly. He knows there's other things going on, not just in the West, but outside of it. But then comes this. He insists that the only moral orders that really last have three principles at their heart. These are the ones that survive the competition that goes on among moralities. And the three principles are family, private property, and individual freedom. So now we've got the complete ideology that makes traditional morality absolutely reconcilable with a principle of freedom and a principle as well of the intact heteronormative family uh, and private property, private ownership. So that's where markets and morals come together. I will say, I've been talking about Hayek, but there is absolutely no way that the other neoliberals don't have this as part of their understanding of what makes the world work. Not to belabor the point, but it rests on like a pretty obvious misunderstanding of how tradition actually works. For Hayek, it's this Burkean set of consensual norms that are refined over the long durée through this almost Darwinian process of social evolution when when in pretty obvious fact, tradition is is constantly being made and fought for. As, as Corey Robin writes, it's volitional, productive, forward-looking, a political reaction that seeks to maintain various forms of hierarchy. If we look to the most kind of classic sort of tradition in U.S. history, we can look to the antebellum and Jim Crow South, as you point out. Ordo liberals, by contrast, are explicitly constructivist. They want a technocratic state ruled by experts to protect the market from democracy, but also this political and social program to demassify society, quote, countering proletarianization by entrepreneurializing, hence individuating workers on the one hand, and regrounding workers in practices of familial self-provisioning on the other. Is it fair to say that the version of neoliberalism that won out in the United States, that what it ultimately looks like is Is ordo-liberalism reinterpreted through American Christian conservatism? That's a nice formulation. Yes and no. 
I would say yes to the extent that we see what we have long called neoconservatism conjoined with neoliberalism. That is, the emphasis on family authority and a strong state that came through the neoconservative movement, conjoined with an emphasis on free enterprise, maximum individual liberty, and a very minimal state. So yes, that's a version of ordo liberalism, except I don't know. There's an awful lot of anxiety about the extent to the the overreaching state that Irving Crystal. Then that looks sounds more like Irving Crystal than yeah, Lipka. yeah. I think so. Um, but but I I think your formulation, you know, it will do because uh, what we've ended up with is an endorsement of an authoritarian state protecting or an authoritarian regime protecting a market order, and a traditional moral order. That move that the ordo liberals made to, as it were, reground the individual in family and even in a kind of almost agrarian pre-20th century uh, village-like life, that was a very specific Ordo liberal thing, and it did come out of uh, something that you you mentioned in the first half of the sentence that you read out, which is they they were very aware of the danger of a highly atomized society that capitalism would continue to produce. They worried about this in under the rubric of proletarianization. What happens when you just turn workers more and more into just you know appendages of capital and divest them from their families, from their farms, from their villages, and so forth. So they understood the need to have a kind of state program that would reinstall people in that order of things, while at the same time turning them into bits of human capital. It's a complicated program. It's not the one that I would say has fully endured, though it probably has at the level of mores. And there's a real parallel there again with with godfather of neoconservatism, Irving Kristol, who you write, b- thought that capitalism was good in some ways, but also morally degrading and engendering of nihilism. So conservative morality's role was to counter the moral rot that, that markets unleashed. Right. Church. Church and state. You need um, a state that has a strong moral uh, bent and a strong leadership in that direction. Um, and you need people bound to the values that religion and the family values that emanate from it uh, provides. You write about how neoliberalism has shaped social conservative politics and jurisprudence by linking market freedom and traditional morality together in the protection of businesses' private right to discriminate. Specifically, these recent marquee Supreme Court cases, Hobby Lobby, Masterpiece, Cake Shop, which are revealingly animated by some of the very same sorts of ideas that people like Barry Goldwater articulated to explain their opposition to the Civil Rights Act of of 1964. How have conservatives managed to unite private property on the one hand and traditional morality and the family on the other, and in doing so, use the First Amendment to both allow for private forms of religious domination and also more generally curtail government's right to regulate private business, like just across the board? What we've seen in the last dozen or more years in Supreme Kate. Supreme Court cases concerned especially with pushing back against equality provisions, same-sex marriage, gender equality, women's reproductive rights and freedoms. And we've seen this in Hobby Lobby. We've seen this in the wedding cake case. We've seen this in another case I analyze in this book, which has to do with um, so-called crisis pregnancy centers, properly identifying that they are not medical clinics, but are in fact invested in the pro-life movement. What we are seeing is the Supreme Court utilizing the First Amendment 
and its promise of freedom of conscience to expand the rights of corporations and small businesses. What we have seen is small businesses and corporations getting the right to freedom of conscience, the right to religious liberty, as a right that allows them to push against equality rights when they wish to. And it's a clever move. It's a move that needs to be understood as very much rooted in neoliberalism because it has to do, among other things, with granting economic actors from corporations to small businesses to individual economic actors a status of persons as persons themselves are reduced to human capitals. So let me go slowly here. If one of the things that neoliberalism does is convert us from citizens to subjects and makes our subjectivity, our subject standing into the standing of human capital, that's what we exist as, that's what we exist to enhance, that's what we exist to protect. At the same time, this personhood that is now human capital has extended to capital the status of persons. And in doing that, capital acquires rights, civil rights, intended, if I may, by the founders, <laughs> to be attached to individuals. And these include free speech, think Citizens United. These include freedom of conscience and freedom of religion, think Hobby Lobby, or the cases I just mentioned. So what you get today is on the one hand, the right of capital to do whatever it wants, and the right of capital to acquire the power of conscience and religious liberty, to push back against equality mandates intended to secure the equality of those who previously didn't have it, those who, by virtue of race or religion, minority religions, or gender or sexuality, have been historically socially disenfranchised. And that's how I read this stream of cases in which religious liberty is being increasingly used to discriminate against the rights of LGBT folks, reproductive rights and reproductive freedom seekers, and so forth. And lest it sound conspiratorial, <laughs> it's important, I think, to, <laughs> to, to understand that, is that most of these lawsuits emanate from the Alliance Defending Freedom, that they specifically couch the bid to not serve LGBT people, whether it's wedding cakes or greeting cards, to not demand that crisis pregnancy centers declare that they are not actually medical facilities. Because they're fraudulent enterprises pretending literally that they are. <laughs> yes. The, so the crisis pregnancy centers go out of their way to um, to disguise what they are and to lure pregnant women in. I mean, they, they're very explicit about this. And I write about this in the book. They go out of their way to lure pregnant young pregnant women usually in crisis about the pregnancy in under the under the imagined auspices that they are places that will give women the whole story on all of their options and in fact they're there to keep them from making a decision on behalf of abortions and they you know use all kinds of the usual propaganda and rhetoric to do that but the, the case was about whether or not they had to have a simple statement saying that they were not medical facilities and that a full range of, of medical options were available at the following number and whether they had to post that anywhere in their offices. And they, you know, the Supreme Court said no. And they said no because these folks have the religious liberty to do the thing they want to do. So there's a recognition that these are entities that are religious and have religious motivations, and what's being expanded is their freedom as such entities, and that's how it works side by side with deregulation. They're not being regulated, they're, they're being given more freedom to act as they want to act. Perhaps the, the, the greatest seeming contradiction between aspirational and actually existing neoliberalism 
is the security state in all of its manifestations. We see it at the border, the carceral state, and abroad through empire. But you write that a, quote, twin model of privatization, economic privatization, and also this familial and Christian privatization, quote, extends to the nation itself. The nation is alternately rendered as a competitive business needing to make better deals and as an inadequately secured home, besieged by ill-willed or non-belonging outsiders. Explain this this dual privatization and, and how it links up the secured private home to a secured private nation. Why, in other words, does the neoliberal state turn out to be such a fundamentally securitized and deeply repressive one? All right. This is one of those places where I want to say very clearly that I do not believe that from the perspective of neoliberalism, you can fully explain the security state, the police state, uh, the increasingly militarized borders. There are contributions, there are tributaries, but I, I want to be clear that one one theory can't do all the work here. That said, <laughs> uh, so I so you know we could we could Asterix. make a list of, of ten. <laughs> Ten, 10 other books that I think you should read instead if, if that's what your interest is. But here's what I can say in answer to your question. Though the founding neoliberals were not ardent nationalists, and of course, Quinn Slobodian has written uh, the definitive work explaining the extent to which neoliberalism was always a globalist project, the nationalist turn, which was one of those things that was no part of the original ideal or, or program, I think can be explained not simply by old primordial attachments or the so-called immigration crisis in Europe or the displacement or dethronement, or the displacement onto racialized others of the problems of the white working and middle classes. I think we also need to see the extent to which the privatization of everything, the attack on public goods, and the attack on the social made it fairly easy for authoritarian or right-wing politicians emerging from the ruins of neoliberalism, the economic ruins and the social political ruins, to make an argument for the belonging of the nation to an ethno-nationalist population, a white population, which was being invaded by outsiders. And I think the clearest example of this is Le Pen in France, who quite literally campaigned before she was defeated by Macron on the slogan, this is our house, we hold the keys, we are, well, I'm making it more than a slogan, it was a rally chant, Um, France is our house, we hold the keys, we have the right to decide whether the door is open, the door is closed, and who comes in. And that notion of the nation as a house that belongs to those who are already here comports rather perfectly (laughs) with the idea that there is no society, let alone global society, let alone global society striated by colonialism, post-colonialism, and the after effects of, of American and European intervention in all the rest of the world. It comports perfectly with the idea that we own our house, we own our country, the borders, the walls of one are simply slightly magnified or ramified versions of the borders and the walls of another. No world state gets to tell us who comes in, no nation state gets to intervene in my house. So it's an uh, it's an antisocial, anti-political, and obviously uh, anti-inclusionist bit of rhetoric. But I think it is really important to see the extent to which 
uh, neoliberal privatization is very easily redeployed for something that it was not intended to be used for. Your book tracks the destruction caused by neoliberalism and then closes with a truly fascinating change the way I will think about everything forever discussion of what sort of reactionary subject emerges from neoliberalism's ruins. And and that's a nihilistic subject, the nihilism that pervades so much of Trump's politics from the rejection of the possibility of recent reasoned truth to the thrill in causing offense and suffering and violence and all the trolling to the indifference to climate change and the incel movement to the real kind of celebration of Trump's transgressive immorality celebrated as a sign of his strength and power, including the power to exact revenge. This is visible in and a result of all of these things we've been discussing from, quote, the explicit transactionalism and politicization of religious values to an MLK speech being used in a Dodge truck Super Bowl commercial to the ability to pay for a VIP upgrade of anything to more recently Jerry Falwell Jr.'s brazenly deviant sexual conduct. It's not, you write, quote, merely the inegalitarian effects of neoliberalism, but also, quote, its relentlessly inegalitarian spirit. Explain your explanation of this turn towards such pervasive and intense nihilism and why you say it's worse than anything that Nietzsche could have imagined. So let's begin by stipulating nihilism a little bit. I think it's often a term thrown around today, and it it, it usually refers <laughs> thanks it, to the Big Lebowski. It's usually used, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. It's usually used to talk about you know a kind of either a state of where nothing has meaning, um, there are no values, there's just darkness, um, and or. I'm I'm noticing more and more it's it's used um, in a lot of millennial left culture um, to come close to fatalism or darkness where it's all just going to end badly anyway. So uh, what the hell? And I'm using it a little differently. I'm using it as the term comes to us from the 19th century, from a whole set of thinkers, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, above all. And what does Nietzsche teach us about nihilism? That it's not a condition in which values disappear. It's a condition in which values are toppled from their foundations. And what he means is that as science and other prizes of modernity, like reason and rationality, uh, destroy the foundation for stable values and moral truths, that those truths, the truth itself as a value, but also other values, don't disappear. They become trivialized. They become fungible. They become um, instrumentalizable. And Certainly, that is the condition we are in today. They're monetized, they're branded, uh, they're wielded as weapons, and the examples you just gave are, you know, perfect. Where where you have Falwell, um, you know, really at the end, just saying, you know, I never believed any of this stuff anyway. It was just good business. He was on this like conservative talk show where he was sort of just like, oh, I got caught. I've been a bad boy. It was just like, oh my god. Exactly. <laughs> And, and, you know, the fact that, that Trump is so easily exonerated for all of what he, you know, from his contractual marriage to the sexual uh, philandering and so forth. I mean, we don't have to rehearse it all. It's tiresome. <laughs> but um, it's a condition we need to grasp as something that is not simply describing um, those who are overtly engaged in deploying a set of hardcore moral or religious values while cheating on the side. We need to understand this as a more general condition that besets our culture. It has a lot to do with why we are in a so-called post-truth world. It's not... I, I always laugh about this accusation that somehow a group of academic ma- postmodernists <laughs> destroyed truth. Um, you know, would it that we ever had that power? Um, <laughs> but that 
rather, and it's not just that social media destroyed, you know, that those are, those are sort of grabbing at the wrong immediate causal, causal factors. Um, what has been happening over the last couple of centuries, and Nietzsche predicted this would be a couple century long process, is the, the, the devaluation of values, which he warned also had another effect. And that other effect would be that as values were devalued but didn't disappear, they would also loosen the grip of conscience. Why? Because conscience requires a certain sublimation of, Freud called it instincts, Trump, uh, uh, Nietzsche called it the will to power. Conscience requires some throttling of human will, human instincts, human desire, human impulse, if you will. And when values are devalued, that conscience itself begins to lighten, begins to loosen. It lightens and loosens because the very thing that required this uh, depression or suppression or containment of instincts is itself lightening. You know, if values are fungible and trivial and instrumentalizable, then they don't have that same clamp on the making of the subject. What happens then? What Nietzsche warned us about was that what would happen is that 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 process was one he called desublimation. That the, those instincts or that will or that desire, as it were, pops back up. But here's where we need post-structuralism added into the mix, if you let me do this for a minute. The idea of instinct, the idea of will as this unformed thing is not very helpful. The idea of impulse or acting out from the wounds, from the particular formations that we have, rancor, resentment, rage, frustration, that's another story. And so one of the examples I use is the incel movement, which is what? A movement of guys who feel like losers, who instead of just feeling like losers, as they might have, you know, 80 years ago, saying, oh, God, we're just the guys who can't get a girl. We really feel bad about ourselves. I guess we'll either become priests or we'll just do something else. The rage comes out. The rancor, the resentment, the misogyny, the outrage at other men, the outrage at those who are taking the girls, the outrage, um, you know, part of their outrage is focused on Jared Kushner. How come he, how come this guy got Ivanka? And it's, it's an outrage that also has, of course, turned murderous. I mean, incel movements are responsible for several terror incidents. But you see the same thing in... Um, the Proud Boys, you see the same thing in other kinds of violent outbursts and, of course, everyday trolling. Just rage and rancor and resentment and aggression and so forth. So when people talk about us becoming an uncivil culture and, you know, needing to become nice again, there's no reckoning in that cry with why we are uncivil, what has happened here, which is the melding, I would argue, of this growing, slowly developing, and then put on steroids by neoliberalism, form of nihilism, with all the frustrations and the difficulties and the nightmares and the wounds and the suffering and the failures of living in this world in an everyday way. So that's the story. Well, we're at the the time i if you want do you want to squeeze a q question in it's up to yeah, you yeah let's okay all right let's, let's have fun <laughs> i'll just go into my next meeting totally unprepared it's more fun to talk to you okay you you tell me your theory and i'll tell you mine <laughs> all right so I, I i have a i have a theory about q anon that i wanted to talk to you about that that i came up with while reading your book that could be totally wrong but i want to run it by you i'm thinking first that q anon is for trump's religious right base in a sense, the resublimation of Trumpist nihilism into this Trumpist world historical moral purpose, which might at first sound insane. But QAnon is a millenarian movement that identifies this maximally stark moral divide between an evil elite pedophile cabal on the one hand, and on the other hand, Trump, the hero, who will destroy them, a moment that will instantiate a blessed golden age. And then also, I think that 
QAnon, I don't know quite how to articulate this, but it seems pretty important that its popularity, even though it's been around for a few years, it's really exploded, and the data is clear on this, since the rise of the onset of the pandemic in yeah, March. Right, right. And so it really seems to be operating at the same biopolitical level as the pandemic and the government response to it. So I, I suspect we're going to have, you know, articles, then books, then, then mega books on QAnon. It's all coming. So we're at the beginning. We get to have this conversation before we have to uh, reference a lot of people and, and think about what a lot of others have said. But my, my, my own thinking maybe is a little different because, first of all, we need to remember that QAnon is not just popular in the U.S., A frightening statistic I read a few days ago was that one in four people surveyed in England finds QAnon perfectly believable. It has a big German following. So yes to the pandemic effect, and certainly one of the pandemic effects has to do with this idea, I think you mentioned to me outside of this conversation, that, you know, the idea of extracting a serum from these young children kind of parallels the anxieties about both the virus itself and its movement, but also the possibility of vaccines and so forth, connects with the anti-vaxxers. But I also think... We shouldn't get too hung up on the precise content of QAnon. Why? Because it keeps morphing. I mean, QAnon has had the pedophile thing in place from the beginning, but a lot of its other content keeps changing and adapting and the believers keep growing. So then we need to ask, I think, why a conspiracy theory that, as you say, is very Manichaean, it, 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 it offers causal forces of bad and saviors for good. Why, why does that work right now? And, and why is it so popular right now? And on some level, of course, it feeds what all conspiracy theories and most religions do, which is offer an explanatory worldview amidst enormous complexity and powers of all kinds amidst which people feel not only impotent, but unknowing. So it, it just simplifies and sorts. I think the Trump thing is kind of interesting because, yes, it parallels Trump's own constant invocation of the dark webs of forces that attack him, the media, the deep state. And it parallels something you raised before, which is his constant assertion of innocence, his invocation of innocence and invocation of the innocence of his followers amidst all the darkness and swamps and attackers but Trump's also less and less believable. And I just wonder to what extent QAnon as a conspiracy theory is helping to keep Trump supporters supporting him while paying less and less attention to what he actually says and its incommensurability with anything like reality. Now, that's an odd thing to say about such a wild and nutty conspiracy theory, but I, I just wonder if, in addition to all those powers that we can't sort today and that we feel helpless and powerless before, and in addition to the isolating effects of the pandemic, which many people have pointed out already, QAnon addresses through its sociality and alternate universe. You know, it gives people new friends and new worlds and new causes. That there's also something about resurrecting the picture of the world that Trump drew and the idea of him as savior, even though he's pretty much outrun the figure that evangelical Christianity made him out to be in the beginning, which is, okay, he's an unlikely savior, but, but you know, he's our guy. God sent him to us for a purpose. That QAnon takes that another step and in some ways moves it beyond anything Trump does or says. And I just wonder if we need to kind of move in that direction to understand some of what's happening. And then I want to say two more things. I think we need to not treat QAnon as some kind of extreme that is so... No, let me put it another way. I think we need to treat QAnon as on a kind of spectrum or continuum rather than as something wildly other. 
and uh, by itself. And what I mean is, there's so much today that right and left have to sort in the way of what we might call invisible powers or un- or powers that are beyond our comprehension. Russian trolling, the virus, surveillance capitalism, finance. Who the hell understands it? Even the, 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 the high-tech, highly trained um, investment bankers don't. But then also, you know, lead in the water and, and drug and sex trafficking and 5G. Even Iran Contra was hard for many people to follow. So there's something about the modern force field of powers, invisible, linked, the ones that really are real, like finance and surveillance capitalism. It's not surprising to me that as we all try to piece together this world, some of the piecing together would take this particular form. I meant more Manichaean, more religious, more extreme, but it's not that, that wild. As a, as a deviation from the efforts more generally to, to map um, the powers that surround us, that, that, that organize us, and, and that threaten to kill us, including climate change. And using actually the most mainstream, readily available material created by decades of childhood safety there you go. Stranger danger sex panics. Absolutely. And links so beautifully with all the other ways in which moral panics and uh, pro-life forces have, have painted the world. But here's where I would end. Um, if it's true that the attraction to QAnon is, and I'm just speculating here, is some combination of a substitute figure for for Trump himself. Even though Trump is in the picture, he, he no longer has to be listened to or believed, as I said. And it has to do with kind of a way of trying to navigate contemporary powers uh, when they're when one feels so small and so frightened and so existentially threatened by them. Maybe what we need here is something like a new psychosocial account of the structure of the fetish. And, and what I mean is, a, is to remind us that, you know, Freud told us that structure was, I, I know, but still. That is, I know it's not true, but still I believe. I know that carrying that little rabbit foot in my pocket is not going to keep me safe, but still I can't leave the house without it. And that being true as well of sexual fetishes and other kinds. And since the content of QAnon and other conspiracy theories, including those organizing right-wing militias, keeps morphing, keeps changing, maybe that I know but still is is part of what's working here. And I, I, I wanted to just conclude that I, I think it's really unfortunate neuropsychology is on the rise today as a way of explaining human behavior, when what we really need are accounts of the psyche in a, in a global population facing existential dangers, no reliable sources except your podcast, powers <laughs> without agents, the powers I just described, they're, they're, they're agentless, and no reliable authority overwhelming waves of disaster and difficulty. I mean, even what we're facing just here in California right now, you know, the pandemic, the recession, wildfires, rising seas, it's overwhelming. Maybe we, what we need are, are developments of, of psycho, psychosocial accounts of our subjectivity, our desires, what we're drawn to, what we're, what we're oriented by, and not you know, better and better, better neuropsychological accounts of the chemicals driving our brains. Well, Wendy Brown, thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's been an enormous pleasure talking to you. Wendy Brown teaches political theory in the political science department and critical theory program at UC Berkeley and is the author of In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, The Rise of Anti-Democratic Politics in the West. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that all forms of the state have democracy for their truth, 
and for that reason are false to the extent that they are not democracy. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. Same on Facebook. And please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe if you've not done so already. If it's on iTunes or wherever, please also leave us a nice review. Rating and reviewing us ostensibly helps introduce us to new listeners. But what really and truly does that is you telling your friends about the show. Please make propaganda for us. And do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge. Thank you.